Good afternoon. I'm Kay McCall, Executive Director of the Renewable Energy Alliance Houston, and I'm pleased to be ho hosting today's webcast on the Houston Climate Action Plan and the role of public-private partnerships. For those new to Real Houston, we're a nonprofit organization committed to connecting and highlighting the many companies and other organizations working in the energy transition, particularly in the greater Houston area. Our goal is to empower Houston's leadership in the energy transition through connection and thought leadership. I'd like to thank the Center for Houston's Future for co-sponsoring this event and for Brett Perlman for being our moderator. As many of you may know, the Center is a nonprofit that looks over the horizon and brings business, government, and community stakeholders together to engage in fact-based strategic planning and collaboration on issues of great importance to the Houston region. Last year, the center released a major report along with the University of Houston and KPMG on how Houston can become a low carbon energy capital. You'll always find a very good report on how to decarbonize the grid in Texas. So now I'd like to turn it over to Brett to be our moderator. Brett has been the CEO at the center for three years and has focused the center's efforts on strategic initiatives that include a project on climate and energy. Brett has an extensive energy career, including as a, serving as a commissioner on the Texas Public Utility Commission. So I'd like for, now I'd like for Brett to introduce today's topic and our panelists. Brett? Okay, Kay, thanks very much. And thanks for agreeing to co-host this with us. We're excited about doing this with you and look forward to uh, continuing to collaborate with Riel throughout the year. Uh, so when we originally planned today's webcast, we were gonna focus on the city of Houston's climate action plan and how companies like BP are forming public-private partnerships to support the implementation of the plan. Uh, however, last week's blackout threw us a little bit of a curveball and has Im impacted uh, these plans and so we thought it would be good to uh, maybe give uh, uh, some uh, frontline view that Laura uh, has from the um, uh, blackout. Uh, and so she'll discuss a little bit about that. And then we'll talk a little bit about how the blackout makes the implementation of the climate plan even more urgent. Uh, so I'm very happy to introduce our two panelists today. Uh, Laura Cuttingham, uh, who is the City of Houston's Chief Sustainability Officer. She brings 13 years of communications and public policy experience to a role at the city. And in addition to leading the mayor's sustainability office, uh, she is the um, uh, public out outreach, the public face of the uh, administrative um, uh, regulatory agency uh, for the um, city of Houston in the media and before the city council. Uh, prior to joining the city of Houston, she was a member of Helen Milton's strategy office in Houston and she's also worked in Washington, D.C. as communications director for the chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee, the vice chairman of the House Transportation Committee, and the vice chair of the Sustainable Energy and Environment Caucus. So she really has a wide uh, range of experience. Uh, she also shares a uh, UT background. Uh, she graduated magna cum laude with degrees in history, ancient history, and classic civilizations and government, and earned her MBA in energy finance and public affairs from uh, the Macomb School of Business, uh, where she co-founded the UT Energy Savings Fund. Uh, joining Laura today is Jane Stricker. Uh, Jane is a senior relationship manager at BP, and she's part of BP's team that is focusing on helping cities, counties, and corporations around the world decarbonize. Uh, she has accountability for building and maintaining relationships with city partners and corporations, and then prior to this role, she worked on the uh, National Petroleum Council study on carbon capture use and storage uh, in coordination with the Department of Energy. Uh, she's been a, uh, at BP for over 20 years and has had a variety of other roles across the company, including in retail finance and marketing, regulatory compliance, and corporate finance. And she holds a master's degree in business administration from Loyola University and a bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland. So on April 20th, 22nd of last uh, 2020, which was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, the city launched its science-based community-driven uh, Houston Community Action Plan, uh, Climate Action Plan, 
uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to meet the Paris Agreement of carbon neutrality by 2050 and to lead the global energy transition. And then on July 22nd, Mayor Turner announced a new partnership with BP uh, to help advance major goals in the city's recently launched climate action plan. Under this agreement, BP will serve as the city's strategic planning and technical partner uh, on the cap for four years and is making experts available to help pro identify priority areas and to lead and support working groups on issues of the cap. Uh, the agreement also includes a $2 million grant to the city's Office of Sustainability uh, to directly support the implementation of the Climate Action Plan and to increase community awareness and participation. So today's discussion, I think, is an outgrowth of that uh, grant and will focus on BP's role in implementing uh, and supporting implementation of the Climate Action Plan. Uh, so we have about an hour uh, we'd like to maybe take uh, the bulk of that time for the discussion, but we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end uh, for Q&A. So please use the Q&A feature uh, in Zoom to submit your questions. So welcome to Laura and Jane, and thank you for being with us on the webcast. Uh, very excited for this conversation, uh, particularly in, uh, in view of what, what happened last week. And so Laura, I might just turn it over to you for a second. And uh, I know you had uh, quite a... Uh, Quite an eventful week last week, and maybe you could tell us about a little bit about how the blackout impacted uh, the city of Houston, and particularly some maybe some of your uh, role uh, last week in meeting some of the challenges uh, caused uh, by the blackout. Absolutely. Um. So I I first want to say um thank you to Kay, thank you to Real Houston for for bringing this event together. Um. Thank you to Brett and Laura and the Center for Houston's Future. And thank you to Jane and the entire BP team. Um, one of the biggest things about the climate action plan and climate in general is that we need as many partners as we can get. And so we are incredibly grateful. Um, I also you know, um, what is the phrase? Um, what, a, what a year last week was that I am so happy to be here to talk about this, but it is absolutely tragic that once again, here we are in Houston talking about another climate disaster. And that's part of the reason why the Climate Action Plan exists was our response to Hurricane Harvey and this series of floods. Um, and what happened last week is just another example of how our climate is changing. And everything we saw with the power outage, with the extreme cold, with the, the water going out um, is, is exactly why the city is working on a climate action plan on a resilient strategy on complete communities. Um, I often say that every single employee of the city of Houston is working on sustainability, um, but also every single city employee is working on um, disaster response. And you really saw that kick in last week. Um, I personally went to work at the Houston Emergency Center um, that we have Transtar and we have the HEC, and those are kind of the headquarters of where all of the different city departments and regional emergency response operations are working together. Um, and that this was, this was a different type of disaster than what we have had, I hate to say traditionally, but because our power and our utilities were so incredibly affected. Um, Harvey was a different type of disaster, but for the folks who weren't um, flooded, we maintained a lot of utilities. And so this really shows how every aspect of our livelihood can be impacted by climate. And it also shows the, the very, very real need to look at our power system as a whole, to look at it holistically and systematically, and to understand um, on an individual level how it works, which you know, we're Houston, we're the energy capital of the world, and we, we energy is in our blood, it's a lot of our livelihoods. Um, but also for most people, when you think about electricity, it's just, it's a light switch. It's on and off. And, and we are so incredibly lucky to have been able to take that for granted for a very long time. Um, last week showed that it is a very complicated system, especially here in Texas and here in Houston, and, and that there are a lot of changes potentially coming in our future. And there are so many opportunities for every single one of us at the individual, at the corporate, at the governmental level to get involved. Okay. Well, you know, you were telling us a little bit about some of the personal stories. Uh, I thought they were really compelling. And I know, you know, 
everybody I think was affected by this. Maybe just talk for just a second, maybe about some of the things that you were working on last last week, because um, I think people will be interested in hearing, you know, what what the city was doing and how it went, and some of the things that you were called on to do in, in your role. So, I mean, every single person was impacted, but a city's job at the end of the day is to protect public safety, right? And so that is true during a pandemic and you saw every single aspect of the city of Houston kind of shift into pandemic and COVID response mode. Um, you saw that in Harvey and you saw it again with this most recent storm. What's interesting is that we were doing double duty, right? There's still a pandemic going on. Um, and so uh, some things that happened that the city just has to adapt and, and simultaneously keep doing our jobs but take on these new responsibilities is that uh, the 311 call center, which, you know, that's just kind of the central nervous system for the city. Whenever anyone has any kind of question or a complaint or a service goes down, you call 311. Well, what happens when power goes down all across the city? And we had folks come into the heck and we um, started up a, an impromptu call center so they could keep things going. And um, we also had I mean, public works, almost every aspect of public works, our streets, our water, um, our, our utilities, including Centerpoint, were all impacted. And so they were all there really running a 24 hour operation to keep the lights on, to make sure that critical facilities like hospitals, um, like our, like the, the building that I was in, you know, the emergency operations that first responders have what they need, um, but also that the system is very fragile um, as we saw with ERCOT and that these are systems that are never designed to to go off and you never want to get to that point. And um, the city's water and wastewater systems are, are very, very large. They cover a huge area. They cover a lot of customers and um, every single city employee in some way or other was, was working to maintain that our system keeps going under very unusual and unprecedented uh, scenarios. And we had things where it sometimes felt like a whack-a-mole game where where you, you fix one problem and another one pops up and that for a couple of days there, it was just um, you know hearing about something and, and sending folks to fix it and then hearing about something else and sending folks to fix it. And then the incredible response of um, when we had power back with the water system, take the while to come back on and to make sure that it's um, approved by TCEQ. And you saw an extraordinary response of hundreds of city employees volunteering their time on the weekends to go make sure everybody has water. Uh, for the first time ever, we had situations where there were, there were folks who were safely in their homes, but in need of critical services, be that water, be that um, oxygen, um, folks with, with critical medical issues or medical devices that are reliant on power. And we were looking into scenarios where we can, do we transport those people or do we bring the services to them? And this is, this is something that the city's not had to do before. Uh, but in a very short period of time, literally we hunkered down in a room and figured out how to make these things happen. And so uh, we are grateful that we were able to do this, but also really, really cautious. And I want to show like, this is not how you want this type of program to be put together in an emergency and just really stress the need for the proactive planning um, of which the climate action plan is one that we need to truly build a, a more sustainable and resilient Houston um, to handle the things that are going to come in our way in the future. Well, I just first want to say thank you for all the work that you did last week. I think that people really don't understand what happens in a disaster and the role that the city plays in addressing all these different problems. And so just hearing a little bit from you about uh, you know, what the day in the life was, I think is, was, was is interesting. Um, you mentioned, um, that this idea of the climate action plan does, you know, fit in this, uh, in, into the general theme of grid reliability. Could you talk a little bit more specifically about all the different aspects of, um, of grid reliability and reliability and resilience and how the climate action plan fits into those frameworks? So I know the city has a number of things and you alluded to them, but just give us a, a sense, because I think people might not be aware of all the different ways in which the city is working uh, on this set of issues and how they might all fit together. Absolutely. I mean, so that is such a good 
question. Um, and it, I'll, I'll give a little bit of context. So I mentioned Harvey and that um, in many ways, Harvey is when I kind of say we, we reset the clock in terms of climate change. And when we talk about climate change, um, in the city of Houston, we, we kind of talk about it as two halves of a coin. We talk about sustainability and we talk about resilience. And so when you say sustainability, I mean greenhouse gas mitigation. Where are our carbon emissions coming from and what can we do at an individual level, at a business level, at a government level to reduce those emissions? On the other side is resilience, right? What are we doing today um, to harden our systems, to protect our communities, to protect our most vulnerable populations from the impacts of climate change. We are extremely facing now, right? It seems like every, every day there is something new, if not in Houston, in cities all across our country and the planet. But also what are we doing to incorporate the data that we have on our climate and how it is going to change into our infrastructure and into our plans so that as things progress, we continue to be prepared so that we are on the offense and not the defense because it seems like right now, and we're, we're constantly playing catch up and that has very real costs in terms of our health, in terms of our lives, in terms of our infrastructure. And so the, the grid fits into both halves of those coins and that um, while there is a, a climate action plan and there is Resilient Houston, which is our resilient strategy, highly recommend if you all haven't looked at them, um, please do, they're incredible resources. But the city of Houston as a whole, we all work together in conjunction continuously. And there's a lot of crossover, but um, putting things into plans, we try to not duplicate too much. And so while some things may be in one plan and some may be in the other, uh, that's just to, to, to keep from having a, a 5,000 page document that no one will read. Um, to, to go back to grid resiliency, it is incredibly important to the climate action plan that it is actually the very first goal of our energy transition is to grow Houston's investment in renewable and resilient energy, that you cannot have either of those without having both of them together to be successful. That when we talk about climate, um, a lot of times we talk about reducing emissions and that is incredibly important. If we want to long-term reduce that climate risk like we saw last week, like we've seen with all of our storms. However, and to be a functioning society, right? To, to build the resilience of our community, we need our power and our energy system to work for us, right? So that's where resilience comes in, that it needs to be built smartly. And that there's a lot of planning and a lot of thought that needs to come into this. And that Houston's, uh, Houston's system is very unique. Um, it was designed to it was designed to operate on its own. And it was designed with some very clear um, competitive dynamics, which for a long period of time have given a lot of benefits to our community, but also there's been this kind of, of looming question of what happens when that system fails. And we saw last week what that can look like. And so when we talk about building a resilient grid, um, it's not as simple as saying, oh, it's one type of fuel or another. I will absolutely point out that a lot of folks were saying that um, we were blaming renewable energy on what we saw happen. And that is absolutely not true. And um, that it was, a, it, was a, it was a situation about planning and weatherizing the system that renewable energy, some of it was impacted uh, but the vast majority of the failure that we saw came from thermal sources. It came from coal. It came from natural gas. It came from nuclear energy. Um, now that doesn't mean that those any of those systems are inherently unsuited to Texas, right? Or unsuited to the cold. Um, they have all sorts of energy generation in places like Canada. Um, and, and so there's no reason why what we saw happen here um, from a temperature perspective needed to happen, it was a planning issue. And so when we talk about climate, within the climate action plan, we talk about how do we reduce emissions as much as possible in a resilient way so that our grid can withstand the incredible amount of growth that we see in Houston, to see the incredible amount of climate variation 
and increasing storms, uh, but also technology is gonna change so much um, that technology is gonna be the key to reducing our emissions, but we need to make sure our grid is ready for that type of change. With the electrification of everything, um, electric vehicles alone, Houston is such a car city. What is our grid gonna look like when everybody's driving an EV? Um, another thing to think about is that while it was very cold here in Houston, the sun was out. What would it have been like if Houstonians had solar panels on their homes, right? That is an option. It would not have solved the entire problem, but if that could have helped a little bit, if that could have been a little bit of an emergency backup source, isn't that worth something to look into? So um, that's, that's kind of where it fits into the climate action plan. And the other thing I will point out is that the plan talks about these things, but the city of Houston and, and Mayor Turner do not have direct control over the vast majority of our power generation and distribution and retail system. That the role here is to advocate and to talk to folks just like we are right now and to lobby the state and the federal legislature for the changes that we need to truly build a more sustainable and resilient energy system. Okay, well, you've thrown a lot um, out on the table. Let me just sort of peel the onion back. Um, you mentioned that one of the major uh, components of the Climate Action Plan had to do with grid reliability. Just so uh, for people who haven't read it, um, can you give tell, talk a little bit more about the other key components? So just so we have a framework for understanding what's in the Climate Action Plan uh, more specifically. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, you mentioned this uh, a little bit before, but the Climate Action Plan is a science-based, community-driven strategy for the city of Houston to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions um, to meet the Paris Agreement goal of carbon neutrality by 2050 uh, and for Houston to lead a global energy transition. So I, at that point, need to give and point out to everyone how incredibly lucky and how incredibly thankful we all should be for Mayor Turner for stepping out and being the very first mayor of the city of Houston, the proud energy capital of the world, and uh, to to look at what's happening on the ground in our city, to look at what's happening at the energy industry nationally and internationally and say that, that Houston, that he personally wants to be a leader on this issue, that that is a very um, brave step to take as the mayor of Houston. And we are already seeing um, such, a, such a positive response to the Climate Action Plan, um, but we're seeing such a response from the companies and the, the residents of Houston. So how important for the city to just make that first step and say that this is a priority, we recognize our role and we recognize our incredible responsibility in changing what happens here in Houston, but also Houston's unique role in that if we can lead this energy transition, we can reduce emissions in cities all around the country and maybe all around the world. So the Climate Action Plan on one hand looks at how you reduce emissions from our transportation sector, from our buildings, from our waste and what we call materials management cycle, but also energy transition. Because if the energy systems that you use are not resilient and have reduced emissions, you're never going to see a systemic reduction in emissions. But then we also talk about how to lead an energy transition on a global scale, because we have so many uh, national and international energy companies based here in Houston. Okay, well, that's a good, maybe a good way to get Jane into the conversation. Uh, Jane, so um, BP announced a new strategy uh, in August last year to achieve zero uh, net zero emissions and to shift to low carbon energy, and then to also invest in um, uh, low carbon energy and, um, and to increase that investment by 10 times by uh, to $5 billion. Um, just talk a little bit about why BP made these changes. And then we'll talk for a second about uh, how those changes uh, are impacting the work here in Houston. So just sure. uh, maybe take each of those questions in turn. Sure, thanks. And um, so, yeah, it was about a year ago, actually, that, that our, our CEO set out our new purpose. Uh, and that's really about reimagining energy for people and the planet. And at that time, he also announced our new ambition uh, to, to become a net zero company by 2050 or sooner and to help the world reach net zero. And so that new purpose and ambition really explained 
why DC needs to change. And then, as you said, in, in August last year, we announced our new strategy, which really is intended to explain how we mean to get there um, and achieve that new purpose and ambition. So our new strategy is designed to enable DC to shift from uh, an international oil company with a focus on producing resources to an integrated energy company, which is focused on delivering energy solutions for customers. So sort of a, a, a pretty significant mind shift in, in how we see ourselves in our role. Um, and so that new strategy really has three key focus areas. Um, the first being low carbon electricity and energy. So here we're talking about renewables, bioenergy, as well as CCUS and hydrogen, along with a gas portfolio that's designed to complement those low carbon energies. And then um, second are convenience and mobility and really putting customers at the heart of what BP does and scaling BP's presence in fuel sales and growth markets. And then finally, resilient and focused hydrocarbons. And so I think it's important to understand that we're not saying that we're getting out of the hydrocarbon business. This, this bit is about really continuing to high grade our hydrocarbons portfolio, resulting in significantly less, but more competitive, both in terms of cost and carbon intensity, uh, production and refining throughput. And so we intend to leverage three sources of differentiation that drive value across those three focus areas. First is about creating integrated energy systems. So pulling together all of those BP capabilities across the value chain um, to optimize energy systems and create complete solutions for customers. Second, by partnering with countries, cities like Houston and industries as they shape their own paths to net zero, figure out how to work together to do that. And then finally, by enabling new ways of engaging with customers and creating efficiencies to support our new businesses with digital and innovation. And so in order to get there, we really need to be a very different company. So, by, so our goals are by 2030, we aim to increase, like you said, our investment in low carbon energy tenfold from 500 million to 5 billion a year uh, to grow our renewable energy generate, generating capacity 20-fold to increase our bioenergy production by about 100,000 barrels per day to achieve 10% market share in our core markets for hydrogen business, to double our daily customer interactions and have over 70,000 EV charging points globally, and to have created partnerships with 10 to 15 major cities around the world and, uh, and three core industries. So at the same time, that means that we have to reduce our oil and gas production by 40% from our current levels. Um, we're focused on cutting emissions from our operations by 30 to 35% from our 2019 levels and reducing the emissions from, oil and, from our oil and gas production by 35 to 40% from 2019 levels. Um, and, and we've made a commitment to not explore in new countries where we don't already have a footprint. And all this is really underpinned by our new sustainability framework and an advocacy strategy that focuses on uh, supporting policies um, that support a net zero ambition. But I think the most important thing for us is that getting to net zero, isn't, it's not gonna be easy. And I think everybody recognizes that. I think cities recognize it, um, governments, industries, and I think what we're really realizing is that it's going to require the combined efforts of government, industry, corporates, and communities all working together um, to implement solutions that will enable that transition. And I think that's one of the things I'm most excited about in working with the city of Houston is you know, having this opportunity to bring all of these resources to the table together and figure out how we make this happen. How do we bring in BP's partners um, either through our ventures or through our suppliers um, to help the city in thinking through how do they implement this very ambitious but very doable um, climate action plan um, and, and get everybody sort of moving in the same direction so that we not only achieve those goals, but we also make the city of Houston the energy transition capital of the world. Okay. Well, let's talk more specifically um... 
you know, about the partnership and some of the things that you guys are doing. And, and uh, maybe I get both of you to comment on these. Um, so talk about some of the areas um, that the city of Houston is working in and the climate action plan and, uh, and then how BP is working to help support uh, s some of those uh, work streams. Uh, Laura, Jane, maybe Laura get to talk about some of the work streams and then Jane can talk about maybe a little bit about what BP is doing. So maybe just start with you, Laura, and then kick it over to Jane. Absolutely. And, and I, I mean, again, huge thanks to BP for, for really stepping up and stepping forward. And I cannot, um, I could not have imagined how just having, just saying that we were working with BP would be such a attention grabbing, um, such a network building activity that the city of Houston can say we're working on climate change, uh, but to say we're working on it with a company like BP, which is on one hand a little bit controversial, uh, but on another hand, BP is such a household name here in Houston. It's one of our very large employers and very large energy companies and that hearing that really resonates within their peer group within the energy industry in Houston. And so from day one, I think from hour two after the press release went out, our phone lines and email was just blowing up with companies saying, I heard the city is working with BP. I want to learn about it and I want to know how I can help. So just from that alone, um, it has opened so many doors. It has brought so many more partners. I said that in the very beginning because partnership is absolutely essential to reaching our goals in the city of Houston. But if the city of Houston did every single thing we possibly could to reduce the emissions that we directly control, that would be about 6% of the emissions in the city. So the rest is up to um, me personally, you personally, but the businesses in our community. And so we really do, we, we work with the community and all stakeholders, uh, but if you, if you prioritize the largest source of emissions, that's the reason why it is so impactful to see really big companies participating. And so our work with BP um, is that we, very similar to how the climate action plan is, is broken down into looking at your energy systems, your transportation systems, your building systems, and your waste systems. Uh, their, their new realignment and their new sustainability strategy focuses on, on those kind of same areas. And so it is, it, is, it is happening as we are working on it and saying, okay, well, what is the city doing? What is VP doing? Are there areas that they overlap? Um, a really neat example is electric vehicles that the city of Houston has committed to electrifying 100% of our light duty, of our light duty non-emergency fleet. Uh, we're about 13% there. We've got a long way to go, um, but figuring out how to do that is actually very complicated. We have buildings all over the city. We have different types of vehicles. And so uh, BP has a electric vehicle um, company, Jane may correct me on how to say this right, and um, that works internationally. And so they are advising us on how to do things, um, how other cities have done things, how they've worked at airports, because the airports are, about, are a part of the city of Houston, but they're again, a kind of special use case. Um, and then they announced recently a, a alliance with, between BP and Uber, and the first of its kind in North America, where BP and Uber are gonna work together on thinking about um, where should electric vehicle charging stations be located in Houston in a future scenario where Uber, one of the largest um, TNC transportation network company, rideshare companies in the world operates. And I think that is such a fabulous example for a couple of reasons. One, it is completely uh, a private um, agreement that they're working on, that the city wants to help as much as possible and be a partner, but we cannot do this all on our own. Um, and so if we can empower Houstonians, businesses to take these things on, that is the definition of success to me. The other thing is that when we talk about, when we talk about everything in the climate action plan, equity is at the core. E 
equity is a lens you have to view everything through. Equity will determine if a project um, succeeds or fails. And so electric vehicles are a really good example also of um, the technology that can reduce our emissions, but it needs to be affordable, it needs to be available, and it needs to be accessible to our entire community. So the rideshare example is a creative and innovative way that we can get EVs um, throughout our entire community. And, it, and you're not putting it onto the, the consumer, to the homeowner, to, to low to moderate income families and saying that you have to buy an electric vehicle. You're going to be cost competitive um, in the near future. They're already becoming really, really, really more available, but not necessarily in the same way that if you went to a car dealership right now, um, as you would see a, a traditional gasoline powered vehicle. So rideshare can help open doors and be an affordable way for people to experience electric vehicles. Um, they're highly utilized, which means they drive around all the time. They're, they're using a lot more gas miles. And so electrifying them will benefit every single Houstonian just from the air quality and the health benefits that we would see there. Uh, Jane can talk more because we are working on all kinds of different ideas. Okay, well, let's, kick, let's, let's kick it over to Jane and see what she has to say on some of the ways that, um, uh, the interesting ways that VP is working with the city to implement the climate action plan. Jane? Thanks for it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, to Laura's point, I think there are things that we are doing directly with the city to help them think through as a technical advisor, as a planning partner, think through how to implement things that are already in the, in the cap. And then I think the, the other element is this Uber BP example where we're looking at what are the things that we can do in the city of Houston that support the climate action plan that aren't necessarily tied directly to, um, to our relationship with the city of Houston supporting the cap. So I think it's sort of twofold. It's that what, what are the areas that we are doing directly to support? Um, and you know one of the areas that we've been supporting uh, most recently is in uh, their education outreach effort. And so there's been a, a great deal of effort underway to work with um, Houston uh, education outreach organizations in the school system to implement climate action plan into the curriculum in schools. And so we've been, um, so BP has come in and sort of helped uh, describe some of the things that are happening in industry, thinking about workforce development, thinking about jobs and energy transition, um, helping explain some of the, the more technical side of the energy industry so that that can get implemented into the curriculum in schools and really help drive at, at the grassroots level um, climate action in, in our communities. Uh, you know, I think we continue to look for ways to support um, and help the, um, whether it's the fleet department or the airports or, um, or other parts of the organization. I think, you know, Laura has done an amazing job so far as a sustainability office of one, essentially, or very few, um, you know, trying to get a number of organizations, a number of different departments across the city of Houston to understand how to implement or how to make the climate action plan a part of their um, operations day to day. And so where we've got experts who can come in and talk about um, biodiesel options or fuel, you know, reduced emissions fuel options and provide that expertise and help educate um, the city staff around what's available, what that pathway could look like and, and how they can get to those low carbon solutions. Um, I think those are, those are some of the early areas where, where we've identified opportunities to work together. Okay, well, you mentioned, I think one thing you mentioned in passing is that um, there's a lot of work that's being done at the city, but that's only, the city is only about 6% of the carbon emissions. So maybe talk a little bit about how we take the show on the road and how we expand beyond the city to get other companies, or I mentioned other companies are interested, other companies involved in making commitments, because I know that is part of the um, uh, part of some of the work that you're doing as well. So Laura or Jane, who, who wants to uh, talk about that? Jane, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about it. So I think, you know, we're exploring, a, a, I think, a pretty exciting opportunity um, to pull together and really demonstrate the power of partnership and bring together um, a number of organizations that work directly with the city of Houston um, and work with each other 
um, and, and community organizations to really encourage and, and create a call to action for corporates to support um, the, the climate action plan. So really um, sort of coming up with this concept of how do you get um, almost like a, a pledge where corporates can, where we can lay out for a corporate who maybe doesn't know how to get started or, or how they can do something to reduce their emissions footprint and support the climate action plan to say, you know, what are some simple things that any business in Houston could do today or tomorrow um, to, to support that plan to demonstrate their commitment to the climate action plan and to do something that's meaningful and impactful in terms of moving us forward towards net zero. So um, I think, you know, we're in the early stages of, of bringing this concept together, but I think it, it's taking that idea that Laura mentioned around so many companies that are saying, what can I do? How can I help? How can I be a part of this? And putting some structure and frame around that so that we can um, give some guidance and really help people understand, uh, help businesses understand what they can do um, and some of the even simple things that they can implement that would have an impact in the areas of the climate action plan. So in transportation, in building management, in materials management, and, and in the energy transition. So I think that's going to be a really exciting piece of work as it develops. Okay. Laura, comments on that? Absolutely. That um, I am so, I was so impressed by how many companies reached out that that itself is a sign of how far Houston has come. Again, climate change was a, it still is a touchy, touchy subject, um, but not a topic that we discussed a couple of years ago. We can't not talk about climate anymore. And this is taking the next step and saying, okay, what are the, what are the actions we can do? Um, and then also because we are such a deregulated system, because the city of Houston doesn't have zoning, because we don't directly control the utilities, um, it's harder for the city to replicate some of the programs that other cities have. And so this is our effort to do it the Houston way, right? That our city is built on public-private partnerships. And so let's see how much we can do by companies coming together and using our collective energy knowledge, but just doing the right thing to get us on that track to be leading a low carbon energy future. Okay, um, just another question for you. You mentioned in passing um, inclusivity and equity and uh, maybe talk a little bit about you from your perspective. How does uh, some of the mayor's work on equity and inclusivity fit into the climate action plan and environmental justice as I know, uh, a big theme, both uh, nationally and um, uh, a growing theme locally. So maybe talk a little bit about how equity and inclusivity are part of uh, some of this work. Absolutely. So um, as you just said, and as I, I mentioned a little bit before, that equity is embedded in every part of the climate action plan. But also remember that, again, the climate action plan is, is part of the overall climate response and climate efforts in the city of Houston, that we also have Resilient Houston that has an entire section that talks about equity as it pertains to climate, but as it pertains to our community as a whole, and that there's an entire section that talks about environmental justice, because um, some actions that can reduce emissions definitely can impact environmental justice, but there are also other actions, other regulatory mechanisms that have to take and then overlay on top of that, uh, Mayor Turner's Complete Communities Initiative, which goes even further and really focuses on the communities that are most vulnerable here in Houston. We have many and we are a diverse city. And so we have a lot of communities, but you can't lump them all together. So Complete Communities really um, focuses in on the individual needs and the, the requests, right? Trying to learn from the communities, what are their top issues? What are, what are their challenges? What do they need? And then all of the city departments and all of these strategies take that information and find a way that we can, we can plug it in together. And a really good example of that is, and it is the single project that I am most proud of working on while at the city of Houston, is the Sunnyside Solar Farm. And um, that this is 
part of the climate action plan and it will help increase our renewable energy usage, improve air quality. Um, it also is addressing a brownfield site, a 240 acre former landfill in Sunnyside. Um, but Sunnyside is one of the mayor's complete communities. And so through the complete communities process, the landfill comes up over and over and over again as a challenge for that community that is um, a my minority majority community, it's economically underperforming compared to the rest of the city. And, and part of that is that the city of Houston uh, built a very large landfill in the middle of their community in the 30s. And um, the landfill closed in the 70s, closed 50 years ago. And it has, it has sat there. It was closed, but it was not capped because capping a landfills um, was not even a, a practice back then. And so it's just basically been dormant. And uh, landfill remediation is a huge challenge. And the idea that we are taking what has been a, a burden to this community and turning it into an asset in terms of energy generation, in terms of job creation, in terms of environmental protection, um, but just in terms of we're gonna we're gonna help put Sunnyside on the map. Um, and it's it's called Sunnyside, and it's gonna be home to what could be the largest urban landfill, urban solar farm uh, in the country. I think that that, um, that, is the, that is what can happen when cities really look at coming up with innovative strategies to address our environmental justice problems, but bringing in resilience, bringing in energy transition, bringing in sustainability all at one. And so that is the type of solving for multiple challenges at once that is at the heart of Mayor Turner's um, equity strategy. Cool. Well, I, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, but I know a lot of people would like to know you, and you've alluded to it a couple different times, both of you have. So maybe both of you could comment on how do you see this going forward and how do you get others involved, whether they're community groups, individuals, you've talked a little bit about companies. How can we all play a role in, um, in implementing uh, the climate action plan? And uh, what, would you, what would you recommend uh, for someone who's listening to this um, webcast? Uh, what, what should they be doing specifically? Jane, you wanna go first? So I would say the first thing I would, I would suggest is sign up for one of the working groups. Um, there are four working group, five working groups, I think, um, for supporting the four different areas of the Climate Action Plan and the equity group. Um, I think that's an incredibly impactful way for someone who is a resident of Houston um, or um, wants to support the Climate Action Plan to really get in, roll their sleeves up and help figure out how to implement this plan. Um, you know, there are working group leads. Kay is one of the working group leads. Um, and, and so I think they've got their work cut out for them in terms of um, progressing a number of these things as Laura said, you know, the, the city can only implement so much. And so there are lots of things that folks can do to support the plan. Um, and, and also just to start making changes, start thinking about what they can do as a resident of Houston to reduce their uh, environmental footprint um, and, and support the climate action plan. Um, those I think are, are probably the, the biggest opportunities. I think one other area is, um, you know, volunteerism in schools is particularly if you work in the energy industry, um, whether it's um, traditional oil and gas or, um, or renewable energy. I think there is a need for um, mentorship and, and guidance for education for students to understand, you know, what does the energy transition job of the future look like? How is it different than what the jobs have been historically, and how do they prepare themselves for roles in that in that new energy transition industry? Laura, one add. Spot to on. I would I would say the working groups are a huge opportunity because the climate action plan is community driven. That we we rely on the Houstonians and to kind of crowdsource and come up with the ideas that make these solutions work for our community. Also, I would just say, look look at the four areas of the Climate Action Plan. If you are a 
homeowner, if you are an apartment dweller, if you are a multinational corporation, you have a transportation system, you have, you generate waste, you use energy and you're in a building. And so just start simple and think about what can I do? And then we are working on creating more of a resource that can kind of really give you some targeted suggestions. And then finally, um, the decisions are made by the people who show up and that there are going to be a lot of, a lot of important votes and a lot of policy decisions that are gonna be made um, on this topic for hopefully years to come. And so if this is something that you care about, you know, get involved, start, start paying more attention because again, the city and the mayor are, are incredibly committed to this, but we can only do so much in some circumstances. We have to take it to the next level. And there is a role that every individual has to play in that discussion. Okay, great. Well, we have about 10 minutes, so let's get some voices, other voices into the conversation. Uh, there's a bunch of questions. Not surprisingly, there's a lot of questions on, um, on the blackout, and I'll try to sort of group those and give you some thematic things to talk about. One of them has to do with, um, uh, you know, buildings and uh, building uh, standards as part of the Climate Action Plan. Uh, or do you see renewed interest uh, in improving building standards for residential and commercial structures as, as something that um, you know, might, be, might be looked at as part of the Climate Action Plan? So absolutely. And um, similar to how the pandemic turned some of the things in the Climate Action Plan upside down, where some things we thought would not have been as interesting are suddenly at the top of the list, like bike lanes and sidewalks and people wanting to be walking places, right? And building optimization and retrofits is, is not as an exciting and sexy a topic as solar panels and the energy transition. Um, until it is incredibly frigid in your home and you have no power and you realize that people's pipes are bursting and I had icicles forming on the inside of my apartment uh, because my building is not properly weatherized. And so building codes absolutely play a role in this. Um, adopting the most aggressive building codes as they come out is one of the biggest things that the city can do. And so the 2021 building code will be out soon and that is a huge opportunity from a code perspective. Uh, but there's also an incredible need for weatherization especially focus on um, LMI communities because they are most vulnerable and most impacted by extreme weather events. But I think that most Houstonians would say that we could benefit from that in one way or another. Okay. Uh, another question, maybe get Jane to answer this one or at least start the discussion. There's a number of questions around microgrids that people are starting to think about the impact of microgrids and um, you know, is that something uh, that you guys see as a way to start to uh, deal with um, uh, grid reliability? Is that part of the climate action plan? How do you how do you see microgrids playing into this sort of this energy future? Jane, do you want to start on that? Or have a yeah, so I think it's it's definitely an area that we're looking at um, with MVP through our some of our venture companies and some of our other um, investments and in, in figuring out how does uh, the energy system change particularly when you start thinking about, to Laura's point earlier, electrifying the entire transportation industry So in a city. So um, it, it becomes a more critical element of building a reliable and resilient uh, energy system for, for any city. And so I think it's absolutely an area that needs to be looked at um, um, you know, more for the long term and in, in developing good solutions for, for a reliable and resilient energy system. Laura, any thoughts on that one? Absolutely. Um, there was already a very good case for microgrids prior to this event. And we've kind of um, leaned on the fact that most of our storms in the past have not been wind events, they've been flood events. And so uh, that was just not at the top of the things we were prioritizing. But last week kind of shuffled things around and we realized that um, our, our electricity grid is fragile. and. And what does that mean? And what can we do on an individual level to uh, be resilient? Okay. Uh, here's a question I think that is important to answer. Um, it talks about, um, someone says they're very proud of the um, uh, 
climate action plan, but as now it appears the focus is on tapping giants to join the table on this plan, uh, which is of course logical. Can you please share uh, if you have any plans to reach and include grassroots citizens? And I know there's been a ton of outreach, so maybe Laura, you could talk about some of the outreach that was put together when the plan was uh, built, developed and then maybe some of the outreach plans going forward. So absolutely. So outreach is something that um, you simultaneously can never do enough and you can never stop, right? It, it's continuous, it's ongoing. At a city the size of Houston, 2.4 million people, uh, it, is, it is surprisingly very hard for the city to reach out to every single person. And so we did a year of community engagement on putting the climate action plan together. We had uh, dozens of town halls all across the city. We had meetings after hours. We had meetings on weekends. We partnered with as many community organizations as we possibly could um, to make sure that we were not just talking to the energy companies, right? Because we understand that energy companies have lobbyists. And I cannot stress enough how when I started this in the beginning, there were many, many, many lobbyists who reached out to me who were very suspicious of what we were doing. And that over time, it took a lot of discussion to talk about all of the things that have been happening. And then you really saw the world change at the same time. We are still working with communities every day, all day long. And, and, I, and that's gonna be something that we, we continue to do and we need to do more. Um, that also, I will say that it's not just the climate action plan that's doing this outreach, uh, that it is the complete communities program, that the Resilient Houston, we work with the health department. We work with the Department of Neighborhoods. And um, every year the city has a capital improvement plan set of meetings. And so we are out in the community all the time. Um, but if there is any community organization that is interested in partnering us, with us, we desperately need their help because you know, we, are, we are a relatively small office and we need a small army to be able to really go out and get to get to the communities that need the resources and information that we have the most. Now we are doing some new things to help increase this because the Climate Action Plan has helped us get additional resources. Thank you BP um, and, and other philanthropic organizations. And we're hiring a climate equity outreach coordinator to specifically look at how do we work more with community groups I and mean, to specifically target implementation, right? Um, it's, we want to build a, a line of communication, but we want to let them know the resources they have that can address the very real needs. Weatherization is one, um, rooftop solar is another. Uh, we can talk about clean transportation. We can talk about how we want to plant 4.6 million trees and create 500 million, 500 miles of high comfort bike lanes that um, there's a lot of opportunity for community members. Uh, we want to create a program this summer through the Mayor's Higher Houston Youth Program where we, we hire um, youth from different parts of the community here in Houston. We train them on the Climate Action Plan and then we ask them to go back into their communities and help share that message. Um, slowly by doing more of this, by partnering with more organizations is how we're going to begin to um, help educate more. And, but that's gonna have to just be a continuous process. There's people leaving Houston and moving into Houston all the time. There's not a giant billboard as you drive in that says, Houston has a climate action plan. Um, if anybody wants to you know, sponsor one, we could do that. But until then, <laughs> just a little bit by word of mouth. It's by meetings just like this. Um, but obviously, you know, this, this is a specific target audience. Um, we, we need invitations and we need help breaching that broader audience. Okay, great. Well, we're just almost at time here. It's one o'clock. Uh, maybe Jane, a few parting thoughts and then Laura, maybe just uh, uh, take us home and wind it up and I'll turn it back to Kay, maybe just to uh, close this out. So I think for me, you know, we're a year into BP's new strategy. And, um, you know, having come from a background of doing different roles at BP and, and managing compliance and, and working often with government agencies in a very different way, um, having the opportunity to create such a positive partnership and relationship 
with the city of Houston and, and you know, we've done similar with the city of Aberdeen um, and we will continue to engage cities around the world. I think really demonstrates the, what can be achieved when you bring all the voices to the table, when you bring everybody into the room um, and when you, you know, you get together to figure out how to make, how to make it happen. Um, and so for me, it's been super exciting this last six months of working with the, the city of Houston and, and being sort of a part of the sustainability team in Houston to figure out how to get this climate action plan done. So um, I'm really looking forward to the next three and a half years to, to see what we can get done. Fantastic. Laura, I'll give you the last word here. Any parting thoughts? I mean, agreed that it has been, it has been really exciting, challenging, um, roller coaster of a past couple of months, years, time is fluid. Uh, but I take away an incredible amount of, of inspiration that despite all of the challenges facing our community, Houston especially, that Houstonians are coming together and they are prioritizing climate, they are prioritizing resilience, uh, partly because we have to, but also partly because we see this as, as central to our future. And so I just um, am grateful to have this opportunity to talk. And if anyone is interested in working with our office, if you have ideas, uh, we have an open door, email us, go to our website, which is greenhoustontx.gov. You can read the climate action plan, um, but we're, we are absolutely looking for more partners to help, to help Jane, to help my team um, work on accomplishing the goals in the climate action plan. Well, good. You know, well, it does take a village to do this. So I uh, really think that what you're doing is amazing, but it will take all of us working together to, to, to accomplish this goal. And we did put into the chat if, uh, for those who haven't seen it, the, uh, the website. So there you can sign up. Uh, Kay, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, uh, would you like to say any uh, parting words or close, close this out in any way? Thank you, of course, to everybody who joined us today. But also thank you to the to three of our thought leaders that we have in Houston. We're very fortunate to have tremendous thought leadership that's coming out of the Center for Houston's Future, out of BP, and out of um, the city of Houston. And um, you know, I think we can all appreciate that we're on a journey, and it's it's great to have leaders who are working hard for for the betterment of all of us. So thank you. And again, thanks everybody for tuning in today. Okay. Take care. See you guys. Thanks. Thanks.